Hello, welcome at Classics Festival, first edition. Uh, a contemporary uh, classic affair, a very nice uh, touch. We were at the first uh, discussion one to on one to one at the festival. Uh, we will talk with uh, Peter Tornquist. Uh, I will say something about uh, his uh, biography until now, and then mm -hmm. we will uh, start a conversation. And during the conversation, uh, you can, of course, you are, you are invited to um, write down some questions if you have and send them over, and I will read them read for him. <clears throat> Peter Tornquist is an international composer and uh, principal rector of the Norwegian Academy of Music Oslo. Tornquist is a Swedish, has a Swedish background, but uh, was raised in Switzerland and Brazil. He moved to Norway in 1984 to study composition with Lasse Torensen at the Norwegian Academy. Since 1st of August 2013, Peter Tornquist took over as new headmaster of the Norwegian Academy of Music. Peter Tornquist, welcome to Yash. Thank you very much. I have a large question for the beginning of our conversation. <laughs> <clears throat> what does classical music represent in today's music? Um. Well, before I answer that, I would only apologize for the, we need to do this in English. My Romanian is still not very good. The role of, of, of classical music today is, in many ways, you could, see that, you could say that classical music has never been as big as it is today. And we like to think that classical music is an endangered species, like, uh, like an elephant that is dying out, but it's not. Uh, if you think back, and you just look at the, the gallery of the lords here up, yeah? going back to the 1600s, 1500s, classical music has developed from being something from the elites to the masses. Classical music has developed from halls like this into concert halls, into the private homes of people. And now, classical music is everywhere in the private life. Uh, most young people relate to classical music through this today. Which means that... Smartphones. Which means that classical music is everywhere. And... But at the same time, it is naturally competing with a lot of other forms of music. So classical music has, go, has gone from being one exclusive, sort of very high part of the period, to being a part of the base. But in that move, it has actually been democratized and it's available to everyone. And this is a blessing, but also a huge challenge. 20 years ago, being... Uh younger than now. <laughs> uh, I, wa I, have, I had this talking with um, a, a friend of mine about classical music and we reached this level of, uh, in, of a composer like Shostakovich, Prokofiev, I don't know, from Bela Bartok and ask ourselves who will be the next composer, what the music sounds like mm. in the next period. We don't have a clue. We, we didn't have a clue <laughs> no. back then. And found out, uh, we, we learn about composer, Polish composer, Panderecki, Pederecki, or something like that. There are two, <laughs> actually. There are many. And we plus. didn't understand anything of <laughs> their music. What can you tell us about yeah. this kind of uh, feelings? You know, if, if I knew who was going to be the next Prokofiev or Shostakovich, I would hire this person as a professor in my academy today. Uh, so we don't know. But what we do know is that uh, some of the music being written today will be considered classical tradition in 50 years. Uh, I, I, some weeks ago, I, I attended a concert in Thailand, in Bangkok, 
with the big Thailand Symphony Orchestra. They played the entire music of the Harry Potter film, the first Harry Potter film, live. So with the movie and the orchestra playing it live. And there were 4,000 people in the audience. And they sat quiet for two and a half hours and actually cheering every time something, but listening to what is essentially classical music played from a li live orchestra. Now, this is John Williams. You have Hans Zimmer, uh, who's already another film composer. And you have a number of composers writing for video games today that we don't hear about. But I can tell you that our kids <coughs> listen to that music and they adopt that as a classical tradition. In addition, there will be a, not, a lot of different experiments crossing over between jazz, improvisation, folk music, popular music. We don't know and we shouldn't know. But, you know, classical is something also that the, the, it cannot be defined in time. Mozart was not a classical composer. He was a contemporary composer. Prokofiev was, was not a classical composer. It becomes classical because you find that it's, it stands the test of time. So this is, so there will be something of today that will be considered, and it will be played by the Philharmonic in Yash also. Hopefully. All right. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> In your childhood, what did you learn about music in Brazil? Oh, yeah. Well, you know, I, I lived many places. So, I, but I lived, uh, I lived some some important years in Brazil, and um, it's actually a very good question because one of the things I discovered in Brazil uh, is that talent talent has really no boundaries, but. Uh, Talent depends on the cultural setting you have. So you will get different influences. In a place like Brazil, and there are many countries like that around the world, music is such an important part of everyday life that uh, rich people or poor people will meet around the same music uh, and they will play the instruments that are necessary. So, so for instance, Piano is not a very big instrument in Brazil. Guitar is a very, very big instrument. And then it goes also guitar in, in, um, in jazz, in popular music, but also in classical music, because it's available and it's part of the culture. But these guys, uh, Brazilians, they play football all the time and they play music all the time. So it's a reflection of their way of being and you can see some of that in Italy and as well, or in Spain. So culture means a lot, but talent is equally divided. Okay, thank you for this. Back to the hard questions. <laughs> 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 to what extent the music universities shape the music industry? They, um, you know, this is, this is a double question because uh, it assumes that we actually, actually shape music, uh, the music industry. And you don't? We, we have to and we okay. should shape the, the music industry. But that means actually training students not only to learn exactly what the industry needs today, uh, but also training students to be artists and agents of change. Take for instance an opera house or a, or a symphony orchestra. If we as music educations were only to replicate what the orchestras tell us, oh we need to have violin players who can play in tune and very fast and uh, shut up and listen to the conductor. Uh, we know that this is not going to be the future of the symphony orchestra. The future of, of young musicians tomorrow is to be as good technically as they can be, that's the same thing today, but increasingly 
they need to have creativity, they need to be good at communication, they need to be good at collaboration and critical thinking. You, they need to know why they are playing classical music or jazz or folk music. And this is where music universities come into the play because we have to shape the students so they become the artists of tomorrow. And that will change the industry. What is the role of uh, music education and how can one benefit from it, even if working in a different field? Like um, jazz or... <laughs> yeah, it, it's, I think the, the, the most important role of, classic, of music education is exactly preparing <coughs> young talents uh, for the future. You know, I, I always think of conservatoires or music education institutions as, as a place where you, you're polishing diamonds. You know, diamonds are, they are already there inside a crude stone. You can't see them or sometimes they, you can see, but we can help give the diamond a shape and a brilliance so that it increases the value. And this is related to these skills critical thinking, creativity, communication, collaboration. Um, but also, it's related to the fact that young musicians today, they don't want to play only one sort of music. Uh, the best classical performers, they are also curious about playing other genres and meeting, not necessarily uh, meeting other people who play the same thing, but they are interested in meeting people doing other things. So together they can create some sort of new thing. And this is also important for not only meeting other students. Uh, increasingly music students are looking at universities, at technology departments, informatics, students of psychology, uh, students of, of, of IT, uh, because they bring different perspectives. So this is all about this idea of expanding your mind, opening your mind, because the musical life of tomorrow, I mean, classical music, uh, jazz, folk music, will always be there, but the conditions of the profession are changing. And the best students understand that. If a student wants to be a composer, mm and he wants to write good music and ask you something about how to do it, well, in which area. Maybe he tell you, I have a lot of limitations. I, can be I can't be Mozart, I can't be Hans Zimmer, I can't be Peter Tornquist. What should I do? What would you tell him? <laughs> you have very good questions, you know, it's a very... Uh, first, first and foremost, uh, it is important that you don't become a Mozart or a Hans Zimmer or... And you have to become yourself, because otherwise it's, uh, it's really not interesting. Uh, the, at the time of Mozart, uh, there were... 99 other composers at the same city writing music that sounded similar to Mozart, but he and three or four others are the ones who survived. Because they had, a, they had a personality, and of course they had knowledge and talent in addition to that. So if you would become a composer today, and amazingly, uh, there is no there's no lack of talents. I mean, we keep getting a lot of young people coming and saying, I want to be a composer. And I tell them, but do you really know what you want to do? <laughs> so you, there is no job. You have to create it from scratch. Uh, and yes, but that's really what they want to do. Then I would say, uh, try to be as broad as possible. Know as much as possible. Understand your your time, understand your audience, 
understand the technology that is available today, which is amazing. Uh, but most importantly, work together with bright performers. So working together with the musicians, because you're not writing actually for the audience. It's the performer. The performer is the one communicating with the audience. And if the music can become like the ownership of the performer, then it will communicate. So this is what the composer needs to do. And this is how it works also in popular music, you know. The big songwriters today, we haven't heard about. Because they are working in studios, they are producers, they are writing music for some artists that Rihanna or, or Beyonce, they go out and, and perform the music. But the guys really getting the money are the people <laughs> writing the songs. Okay. Um, I remember that a few years, years ago I've read something about Rossini. I don't know if it's fact or fiction, <laughs> but uh, the story is, is like that. He used to go in the audience when concerts were in, were in a city and watched the people when they clap, when were cheered something, mm. uh, a, a piece of music or something like that, in order to compose in the same manner, yeah. to, to get the sympathy of, uh, of the audience. Mm. What would you tell us <laughs> yes. about a uh, technique like that? <laughs> you're not, you're the, the, Method. The, we don't know if that is true or not, but yeah. uh, it, it is a, it's a beautiful story. And the story also is that he disguised himself, so he would, because he was a famous man, mm -hmm. so he wasn't recognized. But um, what I, I think Rossini did something like that, and I think it was quite usual for, for the other opera composers okay. to do that, which is exactly what we do today with, uh, with social media, YouTube, Google Analytics. We, we keep tracking, we keep looking at what works, what does not work. Popular music does that all the time. Uh, and tracking, tracking record sales, tracking downloads on Spotify, it's also a way of, okay, this works, this doesn't work. But you should not only do that, because it, it will be an artificial way of actually understanding your audience. But you should definitely, as a composer, not disregard the feedback from, from your audience. Uh, but be prepared to challenge and surprise your audience uh, regularly, because otherwise <coughs> it won't work. But this same tactic is still being used today <laughs> in, in the field of, of musicals, now, because it's so much money involved. So when, when they set up a big production of Les Miserables, in, uh, a new production in London, uh, they will do like 15, uh, performances before the premiere and they will have people there looking at the audience and they will say okay oh, oh no this joke was bad this song is too long <clears throat> so it's it's there but, but we we can't imagine Beethoven doing the same thing no because you, you couldn't hear <laughs> 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 and you heard the piece by Beethoven yesterday it was very well, far too long yes yeah. <laughs> no. music studies why should one choose folk music over jazz or classical? One shouldn't, and one still does that. Students still does that because we, as institutions, we are formatting students to choose one program over the other. Um, you know, in, in, in my academy, we have just last year introduced a completely new bachelor program, which is called the Free Bachelor. Uh, and we have flipped the, flipped the coin, as, or flipped the camera. We don't look at, okay, we have these teachers and we have these programs, how do the students fit? No, we look at the students and we look, what is your talent? What is your artistic idea? How can we help you develop as an artist? And, and some, of the, some of the students we took in in this very first year, uh, they are you know, 
they might play the jazz saxophone as well as they play classical saxophone. Why should we make them choose and limit themselves? So we are trying to keep everything open. So increasingly, we will see that people, young people coming to music education today, they will go to have a bachelor degree in music and they will have different tastes or even more so there will be an, um, a degree in music performance that will include also some theater, technology, film. We don't know, but we certainly know that we need to, we need to try to imagine a professional education for a profession that still doesn't exist and not formatting people too early is a very important part of it. Okay. The teaching method still differ from one country to another. In what way Norway or Scandinavia are leading the way regarding student development? Well, I think probably the, the festival director should answer that later <laughs> but because we are we are privileged by having one of your best students uh, or performers as our student. Um, you know, it's difficult to say exactly what, what is the difference, but I think what the students tell us is that we, in, in, in our academy, or I think this goes for most of, of Scandinavia, uh, is exactly this shift of perspective. Uh, we try to look at the education from the point of view of the student and well I like to use the image of, of you know uh, driving a car uh, it's like uh, even if it's a, if it's a slow small car you're learning to drive or you're driving already a rally car yeah? you as a student you need to be actually at the driving wheel you need to make the decisions of how fast when to brake when to turn but in the seat be beside you, you have a very knowledgeable, experienced driver who has a map and can tell you, okay, there is a turn, there is a left or right, you make the choice. But this will lead you this way and this will lead you that way. So having the student in the driver's seat actually making the choices, that is one of the pedagogical sort of philosophies uh, we have. And sometimes uh, this is difficult for our teachers because they have learned things uh, in another way. And you know, in, 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 in the field of violin or, or piano, principally, it's always like that, that, you know, my teacher teaches the way his or her teacher learned, and this goes then back to, it goes back to Beethoven, yeah? So, <laughs> At some point, everybody learned from Liszt or Beethoven. And, and this is still true. I mean, there are still some ways of playing the piano today that, that have not changed. But we would do a very big failure today if we didn't allow a piano player to also experiment with playing on old pianos, uh, playing cembalo, playing on synthesizers, and being able to play jazz, even if you're an expert in Beethoven. That would be a big failure. And no teacher can do that alone. So the idea of one teacher and a class of students, that is very normal still in many parts of the world, but that idea is being challenged. And I think my institution is challenging that a lot. I think Dragos would uh, concur. Hopefully, I don't know. Yeah. Peter, how should we deal with our own capacity of concentration, of focus? I ask you this because we are now uh, used to listen pieces of music for three minutes, four minutes, maybe seven minutes length. And symphonies, the operas, they have one hour, three hour, or some three hours. What tips and tricks can you give us about how to focus, how to stand still in a hall and listen to music? 
the classical music. <laughs> the classical. I think the first one is to is to make sure that these are closed, and because this is actually a, it's a great tool, but it's it's doing something with with the attention span of of young people today. Not all the young people. I think, in fact, uh, the younger generation is better equipped to deal with it than than we are because we are so fascinated by it. But. You know, I think there's also a myth in this. Um, everybody attends a movie that is two hours, two and a half hours long, and never complains about, oh, wow, oh, good, I, I slept after 20 minutes, oh, this is too long. Uh, you're still able to read a book, a novel, of 500 pages. Oh, okay, you might not read more than 20 pages every day, but you're still reading it. You still keep the focus over long term. And, you know, this is a very blasphemic analogy, but in fact, a great, great lot of people enjoy watching two times 45 minutes football. You know, and f 45 minutes is a long time. It's, it's a time of a Beethoven sonata. And most people would die during, oh, do I really? Oh, no, there's another movement. Oh, God. But 45 minutes watching intensely, 20 players very tactically. Or like I told you uh, when we were discussing this initially, one of the big, big um, developments in broadcasting in TV is, is uh, e-games and chess. Chess is huge in in broadcasting in TV now and you can see you can imagine I mean just imagine a game of chess when nothing happens for 20 minutes and two sweaty people just sitting and looking but people love it because and this is the interesting thing is because there is an added value people are there's a story being tell, told someone is telling a story about oh if he moves the bishop, then this happens. And you start thinking, oh, really, would that end? And what, why doesn't he do that? And then computers can simulate what would happen. And suddenly, bam, you have the bishop moving. And then after just 30 seconds, the one makes a different move. And, and you're sitting there. Classical music can learn a lot about that, about not only telling people that, Welcome to the concert. Now you're stuck in this chair for two hours. If you're lucky, there's intermission, then there's champagne in the, in the lobby. But now you actually have to listen to something. Now, I think if you... One of my most fantastic experiences in classical music recently was uh, one of our professors uh, in the first day of... of the, for the first year students, I gave a speech introducing, welcoming the students, and this professor was going to talk about something, interpretation. And he sat down at the piano and played a music that I had never heard. And no one of the students had ever heard it, and it was a long piece. 25 minute sonatas, sonata by Fanny, Fanny Mendelssohn. And the idea was to say, Okay, fantastic music, nobody knows what it was, nobody could see. I was even thinking, because this professor is also a composer, I think, is he f making up that, is he improvising? What's his point? And you could see the students listening to that and trying to process, oh, what is this? Oh, is it romantic music? Is it, uh, is it Schumann? No, it's, uh, could it be some American composer? You know, it's exactly the same thing. Oh, what if the bishop moves? And, and then suddenly something new appears. And then they realize, ah, the story is, this is a composer that never got her music out in public. So this is a piece that is a fantastic piece. So you don't listen to it because you know this is a sonata written in 1848 by this and this composer. You listen to it as music. And I think classical music, and this festival could have a huge potential in this, classical music can communicate by actually telling stories in a way that we are not usually doing today, and not this, the normal story of, 
uh, this is a great masterpiece which is 100 years old. No, this is, some, this is simply music. And these young performers, they are not the ones who have won three competitions or five. No, they are just fantastic musicians. And they are perhaps playing together for the first time. So concentration is still there. But we need to understand that we need to shift things around. And uh, again, classical music still has this power, but it's going to change. Okay. One more heavy question, and then <laughs> <laughs> an easy one. <laughs> International cooperation. Um, what, in what projects can music university enroll together? In, in what projects can they not collaborate? That's more the question, because um, music uh, is, is one of the most international disciplines uh, there is. It, of course, it's a, it's a cliche to say that uh, music is an international language, but it's also true. And, and uh, especially classical music is, is now developing in parts of the world where it hasn't been big. Um, China is currently the biggest country for classical music. It's the biggest market. It's the country with the most symphony orchestras, with the most performance. Uh, you know, uh, Dragos, I hate to tell you this, but there are 40 million Chinese pianists with an education. Yeah? Not professional players, but 40 million who have had an education in piano music. Exactly. And this should not be a challenge, it should be an opportunity because it means that 39 and a half million of these people are very good listeners <laughs> because they know exactly what it's all about. So um, in terms of collaboration, it is easy to set up collaborations internationally between teachers and between students because they, because they all work with the same material and there's, there's no need for translation. Uh, increasingly, and this is another important thing, if you think about the 21st century skills, which is creativity and, and communication and collaboration, we can all benefit from having international students. In my academy, we have, well, at the master's level, we have a majority of international students, 60%, and the school as a whole, it's, it's around 40%. Uh, but each and, each and every one of those is extremely important because, not because they are much better than the, the national, the Norwegian students, but because they create a benchmark. So every time we get a clarinet player from Spain, the other students learn, ah, this is what the level is. Because they will be competing for the same jobs and they will be playing for the same audience. So, Collaboration in the field of music is, is extremely important and it's also easy to achieve because you all only need to set two string players together and then literally there will be music. Uh, but it's also difficult to get a lasting, long-term uh, partnership with institutions outside the country. But this is, this is why one of the major developments that is occurring now is the development of strategic partnerships in the field of music education. So uh, you're not strong as a very one big institution, but you're strong as a partnership of institutions. Uh, so even the big ones like the Royal College, uh, Conservatoire de Paris, uh, Vienna and, and and also, we are constantly engaging in partnerships. So we have to be aware and watch the power of networks. Networks is everything. It's, it's, but it, it's not only music. Uh, in, in, in media, networks is extremely important. Airlines are in, in networks. Uh, but all the disciplines, also research, if you want to get big money for research today. You cannot do it alone as a university. You have to go in partnership with, uh, with different. And uh, so networks mean a lot 
but it also affects actual music, the basic music education. Peter, let's go to literature. Hmm. What is your, or who is your favorite character who is a <laughs> musician? Oh, who is a musician, yes. I, I, think, I think you will find uh, in Thomas Mann uh, the, the, the most interesting descriptions of, of that, of the musicians. Dr. Uh, Faustus? Dr. Faustus, yes. Uh, it, not, not it's because my favorite, but it's because it's a very accurate description of what a composer is, what a musician is. But, but personally, I have found a lot of inspiration in, in James Joyce. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I'm thinking particularly in Ulysses, uh, because it's such a good representation of the creative chaos of the modern day man. But also in, in um, um, one of my favorite uh, authors is Franz Kafka. It's because, uh, it's, it's not because we're all paranoid, you know, but, but it's because the, it's the little man working against the big systems. And, and uh, that is such a good description of how tradition sometimes becomes problematic in the field of art and in the field of uh, education. So, um, yeah, I think those would be my answers. But you know, I, I'm, in the latest years, I've been much more fascinated about uh, reading nonfiction, uh, history, uh, and, and, and uh, authors like, like uh, Steven Pinker, that we also discussed briefly. Uh, it's because so much is changing in the world around us. So in order to understand our positions, you need to understand history. Uh, we have just recently reopened our relationships with China. Uh, because China was a closed country for Norway because of political reasons and the Nobel Peace Prize. But we recently have opened up partnerships there. And it's totally impossible to work with China if you don't understand the, the history of China. Uh, but once you understand that, it's so much easier to go beyond the cliches of, oh, oh it's capitalism or it's communism. Is it good or is it bad? Uh, you go beyond that and see, no, 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 it's, you're dealing with like thousands of years of history. And frankly, uh, being in a place like this, in a city like Yaj and, and a country like Romania, you cannot escape the role of, of history and the role of uh, this region has played in developing all the culture that is what we today call the Western tradition. And understanding that needs actually reading it. So I've been much more fascinated about the real history than fiction, but you cannot escape both of them. I love, I love to read. <laughs> there are any questions? from the audience. Um. But of course, you mentioned earlier about uh, for young composers that you know your audience. Uh, now, contemporary music is very popular, especially in Oslo, because of, mainly because of the Ruhlman Festival, which is huge. Uh, and I'm asking you now, is there an audience for contemporary music? Do people listen to contemporary music when they're coming home? Or is it something that we want to experience live? And if there's not, not an audience, can you build one on contemporary music? So this was not one of the easy questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of course. I think we have given you too much critical thinking, <laughs> Dragos. Uh, we, no, no uh, you know, the short answer is, is uh, of course there is an audience. Uh, but again, uh, it's not the same sort of listening. Uh, one of the things we one of the things we do wrong with contemporary music is trying to make it behave as it was Mozart or Beethoven and putting in a concert hall and expect the audience to sit and enjoy it and actually enjoy it as something you would put on. 
on your, I, I would be afraid if anyone was sitting in the train listening to, <laughs> listening to Luciano Berio or Ligeti. Uh, I mean, they shouldn't because that's not what you do. But contemporary music is like a lot of contemporary art. It's not a decoration. It's not something you have because it looks nice on the wall or because it sounds nice. It's because it's going to challenge you. Uh, and this means that you have to develop other ways of interacting with the audiences. Sometimes it's about not telling that, oh, now you're going to listen to contemporary music. But just putting, um, putting bits of contemporary music juxtaposed to, to other music is a way of, of refreshing things. And uh, one example of that is, is young soloists who write their own cadences for a Beethoven concerto or a Mozart concerto and sometimes challenge that stuff or improvise it as it used to be. Uh, another very interesting experience I had which was totally unexpected was in many years back in London I attended a performance of the St. Matthew Passion uh, on, on uh, Easter, uh, Easter day, or oh, no, Friday actually, it was very, and, and you know, uh, in the middle of it, they had introduced a very modern a cappella motet, which was sort of just a commentary, a comment about the music, and, and it, it made so much sense, and it then, because you had just heard one and a half hours of Bach, that you know every single note and you love it, and you can uh, you, you know exactly what to expect, and suddenly you're thrown off, and there is something new. And, uh, why? What, and you have to think why? Why? What is this trying to tell me? And then you get another hour of Bach, and you suddenly have filtered that Bach through a contemporary expression, and it makes so much sense. It's like putting a painting of Renoir beside a painting of Picasso. The one affects the other. So it should be challenging, but it should not be the same, the same experience. And a lot of composers and performers doing contemporary music don't understand that, but the best ones do. There is a question there, please. You know, um, I, I think Romania is one of the countries that is emerging as, as an interesting partner for, for many European countries. Uh, it's, it's not only due to Dragos, but uh, I think the, uh, well, there's good diplomatic connections. Uh, Romania has been more active in, in promoting its qualities than some other countries. Uh, but also, you know, uh, Norway is, is not a part of the EU. We decided, n we decided not to be part of the EU, but we are in fact Europeans. 
and we are part of the, of course, the uh, European Economic Area, that introduces some possibilities. Uh, and I think partnerships, as, as I mentioned earlier, partnerships in, in, uh, in the terms of networks, partnerships are also important when you have to deal with cultural budgets, issues of bureaucracy, issues of learning from each other. Um, uh, in, in terms of, of the new European countries, uh, I would, say, I would say we have a strong relationship with, with, um, uh, with Romania, of course, with Poland, Poland also being a, a close partner. Uh, the Baltic countries have been like the entrance to a lot of the, 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 the former area of Soviet influence to us because the Baltic countries are so close to us. But you know, fundamentally, it's all about is there genuine connection on the level of culture? And once you realize, yes, there is, there, you also see that there is also a connection on the level of commerce. There is also a connection on the level of, of, of linguistics or academics. And suddenly, it's all about saying that, is there potentially more than unites us? than what used to divide us in terms of politics. And this is exactly the approach we have now to China. But there are other countries that uh, form officially, there is a, a um, you know, a Brazil and South Africa, and uh, now Korea is also formally a preferred partners of, um, of Norway. But, um, The real value comes from the partnerships that you can create locally. And it's things like this, this festival, and when ideas change, ideas travel minds across different areas of the society. Now we say Norway is a young country uh, in many ways. It's, it's, Norway was a colony under Denmark and under Sweden for, for four or five hundred years. So Norway has tried to assert its role and find its place. And we understand that we are very, very far up north, in, like in the fringes of, of Europe. Uh, so we, we are only five million people. We need to be active and listen to the world, have a dialogue with the rest of the world. And most of the rest of the world are, is an interesting place. Peter, I have two short, tricky questions. Okay. And we can end our conversation, <laughs> I, I assume. If you could outlaw one genre of music, what would it be and why? <laughs> Bad music. <laughs> <laughs> that should be. Bad? Wow, that's the gif. What is jazz? What is classical music? No, I mean, um, music that has as its sole purpose to sell a product, uh, which has no artistic thinking. Uh, I'm not against commercial music. In, in fact, if anyone would look at what I listen to, I might listen to commercial music. But, but, but most commercial music still has an artistic intention. Uh, but there is music that is being produced simply to fill supermarkets or elevators or simply to keep us from concentrating, to fill our space. I would say that is bad music. I would, but I wouldn't outlaw it. I would simply call it by its name and it will disappear <laughs> by itself. Yeah. And the last question is, what kind of pieces of music makes you really, really happy? Everything I can run to. I love, I love running, so I'm always looking for music that I can have in my ears that makes me move. So that's what makes me, because I need that. Um, but I'm, 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 generally, I'm generally listening to all sorts of music. Uh, really, really. I mean, uh, and I like, I like to be very eclectic. 
about music taste because it enriches things, and which is something I also see a lot in, in young students. Uh, they cannot really, they shouldn't really defined, uh, define anything. But there is music in the, in the classical tradition that will always make me really happy. And I would say almost anything by Bach really makes me happy. But what really makes me happy with Bach is the Brandenburg Concertos. That gets me every time. It's fascinating. Peter, thank you very much, very much for this conversation. I wish you fruitful days in Yash and... Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.